Good morning. So I woke up this morning with a song that sometimes happens, a hymn actually. It may be familiar to you. Uh, I thought we might start our time together with that hymn, just one line of it. It's an easy line to remember. It's, uh, we got two hymnals, the Divine Office Hymnal and the St. Michael Hymnal. So this will come from the St. Michael Hymnal. Uh, number 784. It's catchy, it's easy, it's got wonderful lyrics. I think people who have songs in them, songs in their heart, uh, tend to do a lot better in life. Uh, and it might be worth considering if somebody had you just on the spot, sing a song for me, what would be your song? What would it be? you would all have probably different songs. But what would be the song that just kind of spontaneously accompanies you? Different days, different songs. Today's this is the song that came up for me. So take a moment to consider how our Father looks upon us. And we sing, which is praying twice. The King of love, my Shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am His, and He is mine forever. Take a moment to be with Jesus in that lyric. Jesus, we want your kingdom to come. We want you to shepherd us, to guide, direct, and sustain us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. So we'll start with a hymn and we'll close with a litany. The litany that you have is the litany of Christ the King. We prayed it in this chapel robustly on a day in November that would have been appropriate to pray this litany. Can you imagine what day in November this would have been appropriate to pray? Yeah? It was a, it was a Tuesday. Yeah. In case you're wondering. It, it really brought uh, the house together in letting God reign. Realizing who is in charge. And this whole month of November, if you've been tracking the daily readings and the Sunday readings, we've had these apocalyptic scriptures. I wanted to title the talk something with apocalyptic, and uh, I was told by the communications uh, division of our development office that apocalyptic might not be the best way to title something. So let's go with uh, my words will never perish. The king who conquers fear. My words will never pass away. The king who conquers fear. And so to realize with these apocalyptic scenes, the moon and the stars fall from the sky, the sun darkens, there will be terrible distress. What's happening in those apocalyptic scenes is precisely what apocalypse means. Apocalypsis. Calypsis, the veil, the taking away the, the taking away the veil. And so when the stars fall and the sun darkens and people are filled with fright and what's being revealed, what's being unveiled is that we are not in charge. I am not in control. 
In fact, it takes very little in our daily life to help us realize that. But when we have something cataclysmic, like a natural disaster, it's made emphatically clear that behind all of creation is a creator who holds everything in being. This is a very important Christian philosophical point. God is not a being among other beings. God is not a creator among creation, sort of among. There he is. Look, there he is. Jesus makes it clear the kingdom is among you. God is distinct and yet holds all in being. Supreme being holding all in being. And so these apocalyptic scenes unveiling the reality that I'm not in charge and yet I'm held in being by a creator whose goodness fails me never. I'm created in that goodness. My first pastor used to say that repeatedly to the kids in grade school. God made you good. Be who you are. It's a redemption of a phrase that he experienced when he was growing up, which was usually given with a crooked finger and some veiled threat. Be good or else. It was his way of redeeming that experience for the kids. Be who you are. Be who you're created to be. Be good. So as we let that truth sink in, I'm not in charge. Well, what's the option? Because ever since I was born, I've been moving in such a way as to take charge of my life. And I've been rewarded for it many times over when I do a good job of taking charge. And it's being reinforced in such such a way that I sort of habitually imagine that I'm in control. And when I experience not being in control, I'll do my best to regain it in some way, shape, or form. And that is a very exhausting way to live. If that project has not yet been exhausted for you, just keep paying attention to life. We'll celebrate the King in charge of the universe on Sunday. I love the fact that the church has made it emphatic. It's not simply We're celebrating the Feast of Christ the King. No, we're celebrating the solemnity of Jesus Christ, King of the universe. That is a great solemnity. And we end our liturgical year with that exclamation point. He's King of the universe. Holds all things in being. And he has power and authority in his kingship. Now when we hear the word power and authority and might, we tend to sort of do that American thing and rebel. We don't like having kings over us. We're Americans. July 4th, huh? We do have a bit of a a viral um, antagonism against imagining a king. So how might we rightly think of this power and authority? My favorite way to explain authority and power is through expertise. The one who has expertise, who knows their subject, who knows what's going on, that is a way to carry power and authority. I don't go to my barber to ask about car maintenance. My barber might be pretty handy, but he's not going to fix my car. 
and I'm not going to go to my mechanic and ask for a haircut. He doesn't have much expertise. He doesn't have much authority. And listen to how Jesus recognizes that authority in his dad, his father, his Abba. My father knows when these things will happen. So Jesus gives us a way into this kind of life of trust. Trust my dad. He knows. He has expertise on these end times. He has expertise on the on how to hold everything in being. Jesus in his humanity invites us into that same stance. Are you scared about the future? Are you frightened about the end? Be with me in that, says Jesus. My Father knows. My Father has expertise. Can you live in that trust with me, that trust of the Father? And yet you see Jesus exercising his own kingship, and you'll hear it in the gospel. Pilate, confused, you say I'm a king. Are you a king? My kingdom does not belong in this world. Pilate is all twisted up, mostly because he sees kingship as power, worldly power. Jesus is revealing a kingship filled with love. He's the king of love, my shepherd is. And Jesus is revealing something very essential about his priesthood, which you and I are all baptized into, the baptismal priesthood of Jesus, which has three offices, just to get a little technical, theological, an office, a munus. An office is a a place of expertise, And Jesus has this expertise, this office of being a prophet. He speaks the truth. That's what prophets do. He's a truth teller. And you and your baptism are consecrated in that truth, to live in the truth, to become more free in the truth, and to speak the truth to others in your daily life. You're baptized to have that kind of expertise, to speak the truth, to be a prophet. You and I are also baptized to have expertise in offering sacrifice, in sanctifying and making holy. That's the role of a priest. So a prophet and a priest, you and I are baptized into prophecy and priesthood. And so your sacrifices have meaning. Your signs of the cross are efficacious. You can bless your children. It means something. You share in that priesthood. And you'll hear in the preface this Sunday, it's a very rich preface. If you ever want to know what a day is like, I think I mentioned this before, what's martyrdom all about? Look at the preface for martyrs. What's being a pastor all about? Look at the preface for pastors. What's this solemnity of Christ, the king of the universe, all about? Look at the preface. He's established a royal nation, a priesthood. He's made his own a nation of priests. And so all of us participate as well in his kingly power. So he's prophet, he's priest, and he's king. He has three areas of expertise, three offices, three places of authority, and you share in that authority to govern your life. And you're gifted to govern your life, to order your life. And as you watch Jesus through the Gospels, you can't help but marvel at how well he orders things. He's doing it all the time. Have them sit down in groups of 50. Okay, I guess this is how you feed 5,000 people. And they do it. You'll see a donkey, a, a foal, a year old tied to a tree. You'll see a man walking with a water on his head and you'll say, my master has need of this room. He... He's always arranging for meals. He's arranging travel. He's arranging retreats. Come away by yourselves and rest a while. I don't know if you've ever tried to arrange travel and retreats and meals. Have you? It takes some effort. You've got to know where the bathrooms are. Where do we sleep? Sleeping, eating, and everything else. Jesus is coordinating this 
You get glimpses of it, and you're like, wow, this is a kingly man. And here's the really good news. As you watch him throughout the Gospels, he gathers people around him, and then he begins to order the people in these various layers, the 72 disciples, and the feeding of the 5,000, and the healing. Healings are ordering of a person's life. When I'm sick, my body is disordered, which is why I always kind of get a little distressed when people say, I don't believe in organized religion. You ever been around a disorganized body? It's not doing so hot. An organized body, an ordered body, is a healthy body. And so he starts to arrange this body of people and gather and name 12. And then often go off with his best friends, his besties, his three, his privy three, three, Peter, James, and John. So he has has layers of relationships. He orders these relationships and he establishes those 12 in a sort of intimate coaching, teaching them how to serve and do this in memory of me. And he gives a priesthood for the priesthood. How ordered is that? So he gives us a ministerial priesthood, which is why this institution exists to give to the body, the church, ministers, men who will serve like Jesus, like the original 12, the apostles, and serve in the the same way, telling the truth with prophecy, offering sacrifice and sanctifying as priest, and being a king, governing, governing well. And when something's well-governed, it's well-ordered. And when something's well-ordered, there can be peace and health. That's what Jesus desires for his church. And he's given it from the Gospels onward. That's really good news. So a lot of our efforts here in the seminary is helping men learn how to govern not only their own lives, but how to see people in that governance in a way that allows people to feel safe and not threatened. To bring them into an order of love that allows for real flourishing. Every family attempts to do this. Every family in their own domestic church attempts to have this, and you've been gifted through your baptism to establish that. And so sharing in the kingship of Jesus has very particular manifestations in your own life. How do you govern your life? Personally and familiarly. How do you govern your relationships, your friendships? One of the favorite quotes that we use and refer to oftentimes is that quote that says, fall in love, it'll decide everything. Fall in love, stay in love, it will decide everything. A lot of governing is making decisions. And you make hundreds of decisions all the time. I'm going to say something here. I'm not going to say something here. Oftentimes, we're governing by not doing something, (laughs) not reacting, not flipping out. And when we do say something or when we do do something and we've decided to do it, that's part of this positive aspect of governance. I'd go so far as to say that might be the biggest need in the world is an ordering according to love. The world is very scary, precisely because there's so much disorder. So by praying and asking Jesus to govern our lives, to reign in our lives, we're asking for something the world desperately needs, but it starts in our own hearts. 
And so I ask you, how many decisions in your life happen out of love and how many happen out of fear? I know what it's like to create an ordered life out of fear. Maybe you've tried that. I want to make sure this happens and that happens and this is going to happen and make sure this happens and holding it together in fear. And it's, again, very exhausting. Fear is a sign that there's some pain there. If you remember the economy of our woundedness, a wound has pain. And around that pain is fear. So a question I ask when I get afraid is, what's hurting? What's hurting in my, how did I get hurt here? Because I'm afraid of these things. Abandonment, loss, you name it. Failure. Our Father, who sees in secret, our Father who knows all, our Father who has expertise in our lives, desires to offer in place of pain, delight. Delight in you. I want my joy to be in you and your joy to be complete. Jesus has joy. He has the delight of the Father in him. And he prays that we might taste that. And out of delight comes gratitude. And gratitude is a love detector. It points to where I'm being loved. And so the the master affects, how much fear do I live in? And how much gratitude do I live in? It makes sense that we celebrate Thanksgiving around this time of Christ, the King of the universe. If our lives are ordered in love, we can live in magnitudes of gratitude. And so for your discussion question, I might just suggest this. What orders my life? Love or fear? And you might say, oh, it's, it's pretty mixed. It depends on the day. Monday's 80% fear. <laughs> Friday's 52%. <laughs> Sunday, 38%. Just gauge your heart. Check it out. If we're attentive to our interior lives, then we can ask for what we need on those days, in those times, in those seasons. Some people aren't aware of how much fear they live in. And when it's held up for them, oh, imagine a life without so much fear. Imagine a life without so much fear. Imagination is the beginning of hope. If I can imagine it, I can ask for it, and I can start to notice it, and day by day live in hope. And what's hope all about? Hope is about the Father keeping his promises, in other words, enacting his expertise, that all things exist in love because he lives forever in love, the supreme reality, the the unmade maker, the uncreated creator. So he keeps his promises to be present in all times and seasons. And secondly, that his power is greater than my own. Hope is built on that conviction. His power is greater than my own. Control can start to ebb away. A hope-filled person realizes I am not in control and I'm glad about it. I am so happy not to be in control. A second question that might help. What helps me order my life in love? What helps me order my life in gratitude? So as you can see, I'm noting this kingship of Jesus bringing order and order allowing for this 
flourishing. It really is a way into healing. If I'm getting an ordered life, I, I'm getting some healing in my life. It's a sign of healing. And maybe just to contextualize both those questions, what helps me order my life in love and what orders my life, love or fear, talk about a time, talk about a recent experience of God's love for you. That might prime the heart. Talk about a recent experience of God's love for you. That might help you notice how much of your life is lived in love or fear, and what helps you order your life in love. Those are some discussion questions for your pondering. How do those sound? Take them or leave them, all right? This is a, a long litany, but there's lots of places you can stop and pause. So I won't pray the whole litany. Uh, I promised folks I'd get out of here by quarter to nine, so I might pick and choose some pieces, and we'll just pray together, asking for the Lord's mercy, which is love poured on any misery, love poured on any fear. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, who has made firm all ages your Son's throne. God, the Son, Jesus, our victim, high priest, true prophet, and sovereign King. God, the Holy Spirit, poured out upon us with abundant newness. Holy Trinity, three persons, yet one God, in the beauty of your eternal unity. Jesus, our eternal King. Jesus, most merciful King. Jesus, extending to us the golden scepter of your mercy. Jesus, in whose great mercy we have been given the sacrament of confession. Jesus, loving King, who offers us your healing grace. Jesus, our Eucharistic King. Jesus, King and ruler of all nations. Jesus, King, truly present in the most blessed sacrament. Jesus, King, wounded by mankind's indifference. Jesus, King, who is the great I am within us, our wellspring of pure delight. Just pause with a line that has your attention. Jesus, King of all nations, true sovereign of all earthly powers. Jesus, King of all nations, subjecting under your feet forever the powers of hell. Jesus, King of all nations, the light beyond all light, enlightening us in the darkness that surrounds us. Jesus, King of all nations, who mercifully sends us your holy angels to protect us. Jesus, King of all nations, just judge who will separate the wicked from the good. Jesus, King of all nations, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. Jesus, King of all nations, whose reign is without end. Jesus, King of all nations, whose kindness toward us is steadfast and whose fidelity endures forever. Amen. Eternal Father, who has given us your only begotten Son to be our Redeemer, one true mediator and sovereign King. Loving Jesus, sovereign King, who humbled himself for love of us and took the form of a servant. Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, love of the Father and the Son who sanctifies us and gives us life. Mary, our Queen and Mother, who mediates to Jesus on our behalf. Mary, our Queen and Mother, through whom all graces come to us. Mary, our Queen and Mother, singular jewel of the Holy Trinity. Pray for us and protect us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.